Thank you so much for having me here. I, uh, I and bo both my, myself personally and the New York Times generally are really excited to be part of the X-Like project that's going to be kicking off tomorrow. Uh, I apologize for keeping you all waiting. I uh, was visiting a friend in Venice yesterday and I thought it would be fun to drive. So I left Venice at 9 a.m. this morning and I figured that would be plenty of time to get to Ljubljana. But I got a flat tire. So I had to, and I don't speak Italian, so I got to uh, have a sort of cross-cultural, you know, experience where I had to, had to show adaptability. Uh, the hardest part was finding an ATM in the small town that they dropped me off at so I could pay the tow truck driver. But I am here now. I got here at 101, so I, 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 I apologize if I, if I talk fast. My endorphins are kind of rushing right now because it was an exciting afternoon. Uh, but uh, I want to talk to you today about some of the cool stuff we do with data at the New York Times Company. I've titled this talk Administering a 160-Year-Old Database because this year, uh, or sorry, la late last year, in September of last year, the New York Times turned 160. And we've been publishing a daily paper um, almost the entire period um, in between uh, 1851 and today, although in the early years we didn't publish every day of the weekend. That being said, I want to talk to you about some of the things that we've historically done to make this database useful and things that we have done more recently to build upon this work. So uh, by, way of, uh, by way of introduction today, I'm going to start out by telling you the story of our first semantic technology. If any of you were at the ISWC, or sorry, the Semantic Technology Conference in 2009, you will recognize this story. Um, if uh, then after that, I'm going to talk about some work we've been doing in linked data, and then I want to follow that up with some brief remarks about some recent work we've been doing in the space of semantic markup, if we have time. And then, of course, I want to leave time for your questions because I want to tell you what's interesting to you. So, Mark, how much time do we have? One hour or excellent. Less. So. Just a quick word by way of introduction about what the New York Times Company is. Uh, the New York Times Company is a global company that holds a bunch of different media brands. Um, of, co of course, probably the two, uh, two most uh, globally known are the New York Times itself and the International Herald Tribune, which is a publication of the New York Times. Uh, the New York Times also has a group of couple of newspapers in New England, including the Boston Globe, the finest newspaper in Boston. And uh, we recently sold our regional media group, so this slide needs to be updated. And we also have uh, the About Group, which, is, which includes About.com and a set of uh, related companies to About.com. So that's the New York Times in a nutshell. I forget, I forget the, I don't know the latest stats, but as far as uh, American whole, uh, media companies go, this portfolio of brands has a very significant web presence when you add it all together. So that's the New York Times company and me. Let me tell you a little about me. Uh, I work in the New York Times Research, Research and Development Group, as Marco said, and our mission in research and development is to monitor trends and technologies with the potential to disrupt or impact the news industry in the three to five year time frame. So we're always looking uh, for the next big thing in terms of technical developments. And then it's our job not only to identify those trends, but to try to, to try to take advantage of them, to build prototypes using some of the technology that's pointed to by these trends. And then to show these prototypes uh, to folks throughout our organization and try to get them uh, into operations where appropriate. So. Uh, my role in research and development is I am the lead architect for semantic platforms. So the area I focus most closely on is what we can do with sort of emerging practices in uh, knowledge management. And my talk is gonna focus on a couple of those. So I, I said I would tell you the story of our first semantic platform. So I wanna start by doing that. Who wants to guess when we launched our very first semantic platform at the New York Times? Was that a hand I saw, Marco? No. <laughs> Probably won't say 81 or something. 1981. All right. The answer is 1913. In 1913, we released our first semantic product, and it was called the New York Times Index. And it has kind of an interesting story. You see, in, uh, in those days, around 1913, the New York Times was just one of many New York City newspapers. Uh, on the day the Titanic sank, you could have chosen to read about, read about it in about 20 different English language publications and several others in, uh, in different languages. So the, New the uh, media landscape in New York in that time period uh, was very, very crowded. And so it was with 
pretty substantial relief that the publisher of the newspaper at that time, a gentleman named Adolf Ox, was able to lure away the manager of another newspaper. His name was, uh, I believe, William C. Reiki, and make him essentially his executive vice president. And uh, in those years that he worked at the New York Times, he was sort of uh, our publisher's right-hand man. And among other achievements, he helped forge a partnership with an Italian inventor by the name of Marconi uh, to broadcast our news for the first time overseas using what was then called wireless. Um, unfortunately, in that, uh, the publisher and Mr. Reich eventually parted ways in 1912, and Mr. Reich went to go run a rival newspaper, which caused our publisher some consternation because he all of a sudden, not only was he competing against all these, you know, these 20 different newspapers um, in just the English language, but he also now had to compete with a newspaper that was run by a gentleman who knew everything he wanted to do. So, to remain competitive in this fiercely competitive landscape, he introduced three new products in 1913. The first product was called uh, The Analyst. It was a quarterly magazine of co finance, com or, sorry, it was a weekly magazine of finance, com finance, commerce, and economics that was targeted in the gendered language of the time for the businessman. Um, he also introduced uh, a periodical, a quarterly periodical called Current history, which focused on long form reporting, uh, supplemented by what was then the emerging field of photojournalism. And the last new product that our publisher introduced was something called the New York Times Index. And the goal behind the New York Times Index was that to that that our publisher wanted to position his paper as the uh, resource that future generations would refer back to when it became necessary to investigate some specific point in history. And I'm not going to say that the New York Times, uh, uh, oh, yes. And when the New York Times Index was first launched, you could buy it for uh, $8 a year, bound in cloth, or slightly more if you wanted the fancy leather version. Uh, strangely, in the uh, years immediately following the release of the index, a number of Articles appeared in the New York Times talking about how great the index was. Um, so the index has uh, continued to operate at the New York Times, and it is still around today, 98 years after it was it, it was first introduced. Now, I'm not going to tell you that metadata and semantic technology saved the New York Times 100 years ago, but it is interesting that we're the only major New York City national paper still in existence. So that is, uh, that is the sort of introduction uh, to the New York Times Index. And just to say a couple of words more about it, the New York Times Index uh, s started out simply as an internal business practice of the New York Times. Back in uh, the early days of newspapers, a newspaper's competitive advantage was to a large part determined by the quality of research that it could bring to bear on, uh, on, its, uh, on its stories. So in order to... Uh, in order to use the paper for that purpose, the New York Times actually internally indexed it. And this is a picture of a, uh, of a handwritten index from the first years of the paper. Um, the index uh, was eventually more systematized. And the, way it w and, and the way that we managed this data was we had a staff of people whose job it was to clip out articles from the newspaper, assign them to specific subject headings, write a summary, and then file them away. Eventually, we, just, we started publishing the New York Times on microfilm in the 1960s, I believe. And we began, oh, sorry, that was in the 1930s. And we began to release uh, the index so that folks could use it to find what they were looking for in the microfilm. In the 1970s, we digitized the index and we made it available um, as our very first online service. We announced that service in 1968 and we launched it in the early 70s. And it was a system where you could dial up into our mainframe computer and search our index that way, which was uh, really cool because it's very difficult to do Boolean queries in a printed index. So if you want to find two things, uh, an article that's about two things, you kind of need an online index. And apparently, uh, the machine that it was run on, which is the one behind that gentleman, uh, was operated by that guy. And we continue today uh, with our tradition of indexing and tagging um, and high quality metadata at the New York Times. And that takes two forms today. We 
continue, uh, perhaps somewhat surprisingly, to publish a print index uh, that, we, that we sell to the, li uh, to the reference library uh, sector. And we also uh, index our articles online as they go onto the website. So both of those processes are still very much part of the way the New York Times does business. And on a sort of, uh, on a practical level, what that means is that every article uh, that we've ever written gets associated with keywords drawn from a controlled vocabulary of people, places, organizations, and descriptors. And I have examples up here. A descriptor might be something uh, like burritos or Exxon Valdez. Uh, location, of course, is a place. A, pe a person is self-evident. An organization is both um, for-profit companies, publicly traded companies, as well as uh, government organizations and uh, institutions of higher learning. So that, those are the different types of metadata that we associate with our articles. And it is not an inconsiderable investment for us to, uh, to do this. We have uh, uh, probably about 60 people every day that are involved in one way or another with tagging our content. It's really important to us to have this high quality metadata. And the reason we tag is because it powers a lot of services on nytimes.com that other, that, that other organizations aren't able to provide because they don't have the same high fidelity metadata that we do. And those services include uh, news alerts, um, and they let us automate editorial co uh, practices like past coverage of, uh, of events related to the story you're currently reading. Uh, we can give you really high fidelity feeds in terms of RSS and syndication. Uh, and we also are able to syndicate this data towards, uh, you know, into other platforms in a, in a way that's targeted to make sense for those audiences. So uh, you might say, well, you could do a lot of this stuff using keywords. And to an extent, that's true. But it's very difficult for almost any other organization before the, besides the New York Times to give you two different RSS feeds where one contains only articles about the fruit and the other one contains articles about the company Apple. So we are able to do that because of this real, uh, because of this institutional dedication to uh, manually tagging all of our content assets. Another reason that we do it is that we have this section of our site called Topic Pages, which uh, includes about 27,000 different pages uh, that bring together our coverage of individual topics that are addressed in various stories in the New York Times. And this uh, enables us also to offer a service that our competitors aren't really well positioned to offer. Uh, so that is indexing at the New York Times. And now I want to talk about how we've taken that work to the next uh, level through uh, the application of the principles of linked data. But before I do that, are there any questions about the indexing process at the New York Times? All right. Uh, the so linked data is, is sort of an emerging practice in knowledge management that's motivated by the fact that, as you can see from this helpful illustration, the internet is a very confusing place. It is a place of competing standards, different, for, uh, different ways of identifying the same data, and different approaches to storing and retrieving that data. So even from the perspective of a relatively, relatively straightforward concept like Barack Obama, the President of the United States, the web can be a confusing place. Barack Obama is known in the New York Times archive as, Bar as Obama, comma, Barack, P-E-R. Knowing that in our database lets you retrieve all of the articles we've ever, set, we've ever tagged as being about Barack Obama. However, in other databases like Wikipedia, he's referred to as Barack underscore Obama. In the Library of Congress, he's referred to as 000167. Uh, in Amazon, that is his author ID. Uh, that is his Twitter handle. That is his YouTube account. That is his, uh, uh, that is his author ID on iTunes. And this is his Facebook account. So as you can see, we have this one entity. But because of the way data is stored and retrieved on the web right now, this one entity is known by all these different identifiers. And it's a shame that they're not all linked to one another because were they, you could do some really interesting aggregations across different databases that let you know more about these things. So that is the idea behind uh, linked data, uh, is, that it, it, is that you are able to, it, it, is, is to identify the strong identifiers that refer to the same real world thing across multiple databases on the web. And we decided at the New York Times that we wanted to, uh, that this was an interesting trend with 
uh, a potential to enable us to do new things with the way that we aggregate and present content. So we decided to do an experiment to see if this linked data stuff was going to work out for us. And as I mentioned earlier, we have these topic pages. And these topic pages contain a list of articles that are generated with queries that look a little bit like that. And these queries, um, the topic pages, uh, there, I mentioned there are about 27,000 of them. And if you, pop the, if you pop the hood on the queries beneath the topic pages, we use a total of about 29,000 unique tags to generate those 27,000 pages. And since these are the tags we've decided to invest the energy to create topic pages around, we thought they would be a good place to start our exploration of linked data. So what we did uh, was we started to uh, we took uh, this list of about 29,000 tags and we started to map them to other databases. Specifically, we aligned our tags with Wikipedia, the strong identifiers from Wikipedia, um, namely their URL on the site. Uh, and we also aligned our geographic tags with records from a database called GeoNames, which is this nice uh, uh, database of geographic metadata. Um, and once we knew how our tags lined up to Wikipedia, we aligned them, uh, we could automatically align them to two other databases called uh, DBpedia and Freebase. Uh, just one quick word uh, about the presence of Wikipedia on this slide. There are some in the news world for whom Wikipedia is a somewhat nerve wracking uh, phenomenon because it doesn't have any guarantee of accuracy or uh, or, or correctness. I mean, Wikipedia, in my experience, is almost is generally right in, on a whole, but at any one point is tends to be have tends to be riddled with controversies and minor errors. But we're not using Wikipedia in this in this in this linked data work uh, for the facts that it asserts about things, but rather uh, building on the fact that Wikipedia has given a unique name to a bunch of different things. And the only the only thing we're supposing about Wikipedia in this in this in this work is that Wikipedia, if there is a name for a thing on Wikipedia, it's probably a thing. That's the only that, that's that's the extent to which we're uh, relying on Wikipedia, and I'm not suggesting that it isn't a wonderful resource, but it's not always the right resource for journal uh, you know for journalistic organizations to build around. Um, so, well, let me say a little bit about these other databases that we've mapped to. So we have this we've been mapping our tags to this database uh, DBpedia, and for those of you who might not be familiar with it, DBpedia is a project that started at the University of Leipzig um, and the Free University of Berlin. And they and the idea behind DBPD was Wikipedia has these really cool information boxes on a bunch of different articles, and it is the case that there is quite a bit of useful information for a lot of different things. However, the way Wikipedia stores this information is uh, basically glorified HTML. There's not a database behind Wikipedia that generates these information boxes. So uh, using Wikipedia by itself, you can't do interesting bits of retrieval, like show me all of the cities in Slovenia with a population between X and Y. That's not possible using Wikipedia by itself. So the folks at these two universities built a system for scraping this information out of the Wikipedia info boxes and dating it, databasing it using semantic web technologies and then making it accessible through a partnership with uh, OpenLink software. Um, to the web um, and making it queryable so people can take advantage uh, and reason around the information that's in Wikipedia. So that is uh, Freebase, uh, I'm sorry, DBpedia. And DBpedia, last I checked, I'm sure these numbers have gotten larger since I made this slide, had about 2.6 million entities uh, for which there were facts broken down into these categories. And uh, perhaps even more importantly, uh, there are about 4.9 million links in, 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 in DBpedia that point to other databases. So if you know how your thing aligns to DBpedia, there's a good chance DBpedia will tell you how it aligns to a bunch of other databases around the web. Uh, another uh, company that we have, another database that we have mapped our our tags to is Freebase, which, um, aside from being one of the most uh, one of the uh, most questionably named companies on the internet, has a tremendously useful ba database of entities uh, that covers about 11 million total topics. They sort of started from the same place that DBpedia started, you know, getting information about the topics in Wikipedia, and have since expanded on that. In fact, I'm told that that 11 million uh, topic number is somewhat out of date now, and that it's gotten quite a bit larger. Freebase was. Uh, it, 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 to contrast Freebase with DBpedia, Freebase provides, I feel, a better platform for developers to build actual systems and services on top of. Uh, DBpedia is great for research, but 
the public facing services that I've used around it uh, tend to be insufficient for the sort of load a commercial service is going to subject them to. Um, that being said, Freebase was acquired in the summer of 2010 by Google and has uh, su subsequently been folded into their operations. But it continues to be freely available. It continues to be maintained. And it continues to be a very valuable research for folks to, uh, resource for folks uh, doing uh, linked data work. The last database that we've aligned our vocabulary to is GeoNames. GeoNames is a huge database of place names, which has uh, geographic metadata for about 8 million different places and uh, fairly good global coverage. That's a little heat map of all the different places they have information about in their database. So uh, in order to get our tags aligned with these databases, we built a tool for, well, I should take a step back and say we have a couple of folks working for the New York Times website whose sole job it is to maintain the indexing vocabularies we use on our website. So they're basically the world experts in these vocabularies. So what we did to experiment with linked data was we built a tool for them that looks like this, um, that, shows th that shows them the Wikipedia article on one side and our coverage on the other and a proposed mapping between two tags at the top. And if that mapping is correct, they click the little checkbox. The mapping gets databased, and we move on to the next tag. There are th this tool also gives you the ability to reassign diff uh, to to change the mapping if it's not correct, and to search for the correct mapping if it's not in the drop-down list of suggestions. And using this tool, uh, we've mapped quite a number of our tags to to, to Wikipedia. Uh, and also, we use a slightly different tool for mapping to geo names. It's the same general principle, but here, instead of showing you the alignments between the Wikipedia article and the and and, and the New York Times articles, uh, we plot out the the suggested places from geo names on this map and our uh, vocabulary experts select the proper location that corresponds to our tag. So going through that process, we've manually mapped, again, I apologize, these numbers need to be updated, about 15,000 of our tags to DBpedia, Freebase, and geo names. So we have a pretty nice collection of linked data now that we can start to build on. And we also realize that um, as, as great as the people that we have working at the New York Times are, we can't be the sole source of innovation in this space. And it would be sort of out of the spirit, it, it would sort of not be in step with the spirit of the linked data community to keep all these links to ourselves. So uh, about two and a half years ago now, we released uh, the first round of mappings uh, uh, that we did with linked data, actually it was a year and a half ago, I apologize, uh, to this website that we maintain, data.mytimes.com. And on data.mytimes.com, you can type in, you can basically get some uh, information about uh, the tags that we've mapped so far uh, in semantic web friendly formats like RDF. Uh, and the nice thing about data.mytimes.com is that all of the data that we provide on that site is covered by a Creative Commons attribution license. So folks who want to take advantage of the work that we've done aligning our vocabularies to other vocabularies uh, need only give us credit for doing the work and don't need to worry about any further licensing issues around that data. Um, we also, much more recently, um, a couple of months ago, actually last month, uh, released uh, our semantic APIs, which are uh, RESTful web services that return XML or JSON, standard sort of web, web services stuff, um, about, that, lets you, that, that also relates to this linked data work. Uh, we have both a semantic API and a geo API now. And our semantic API lets you look up a tag by uh, its name, or also it's uh, URI on data.mytimes.com. Every single tag on data.mytimes.com data is assigned a unique identifier, and you can, look that, you can look that identifier up using this service. You can also search for a tag by name. So if you want to find all of the tags that, you know, say, contain the word Slovenia, you could do that. Uh, and you can also look up um, by article. So if you want to see all the tags that correspond to a given article, you can push the article into the service, and it will give you, that give you those uh, back. Uh, of course, this service will also return to you the mappings between our tags and, uh, and, and, the, and the other databases that we've mapped to, along with some other information. For, uh, for uh, descriptors, for instance, we've uh, internally made a little taxonomy that relates our descriptors to each other. So you can see stuff like this term is a broader term than this term, or this term has a narrower term, and it's this. So those are the various things that are returned by the semantic API. Uh, we also have a geo API that's based on this linked data work, and it lets you query our geo codes by various criteria. So you can 
query, uh, query them by any GeoNames criteria. So GeoNames uh, data about the places has stuff like the population of this place is X, the elevation of this place is Y. And you can submit queries to say, like, show me all the cities the New York Times has written about with a population between X and Y. Or show me all the cities the New York Times has written about that are in Italy. Um, those sort of queries can be handled by this API. You can also uh, submit a bounding box query. So if you have a map, if you have a map open on, uh, in a viewport, you can say, this is, this is what's visible to the user on this map. Give me all of the places the New York Times has written about that fits inside that viewport. And lastly, you can do a nearby query using that geographic API, which we think is pretty cool. We think it will enable uh, folks to build interesting location-based experiences around New York Times content. Because using this API, you could do something like build an iPhone app or an Android app where you push a button and say, I want to know what's happening near me. And we can use this API to query into our, uh, our you can use this API to query into our archive by geography. Now, to be fair, our, geog our geographic terms are much more granular in New York City than anywhere else. But they still give you a fairly good sense um, no matter where you are. So those are the various services we've built on top of our uh, linked data uh, uh, that we have built using the linked data that we have been acquiring for the last couple of years. And before I go on to tell you what we've learned from this experience, I'd like to uh, ask again if there are any questions. All right. So we've been doing this linked data work now for a couple of years. And we have learned a number of lessons through this work, the first of which is that linked data helps with uh, three things, um, adding ontological context, automating our data alignments, and uh, it gives us a platform for doing non-traditional aggregations. Uh, linked data is, however, uh, not a silver bullet. There are areas that we would like to see improvement uh, in, uh, on the linked data front. One is uh, community interaction. We released this data on data.nytimes.com a couple of years ago. And people were very positive uh, about the fact that we had done this. But we haven't seen the sort of uptake uh, that we would have liked with this data. That being said, uh, we have uh, we, we believe that the APIs are going to see a much bigger uptake than the, uh, th than the stuff we released on data.mytimes.com, simply because you don't have to know thing one about semantic web technologies to use our APIs, whereas the data at data.mytimes.com, uh, while valuable, has a pretty steep learning curve to be useful to somebody. So I, I have been carefully monitoring the number of registrations on the APIs. Um, since we released them in early December. And although I'm not allowed to discuss the specific numbers, I can tell you all that I'm happy with the numbers that I'm seeing. So people are signing up for these APIs, and people are using them. Uh, so that is, that is <clears throat> a good story. And another area, and I alluded to this earlier when I discussed Wikipedia, is, uh, is issues of data accuracy. Um, a lot of these linked data sources are still uh, are, are community curated sources. So the data can be modified by anybody, and not everybody modifies uh, the data accurately. So there is a concern about how an organization like the New York Times or really any other news publication can, can use, can rely on this kind of data to do interesting work while at the same time not sacrificing uh, the public's trust in the authority of what it says. So that's another issue. And I don't purport to have an answer for it, but it's an issue that comes up when you start doing this kind of work. So to elaborate on what I mean by some of the things that we've learned from this. Yes? Oh, I have a question about the previous thing. So you said the accuracy is the problem. Are you, so you can map, I don't know, all your persons to Freebase. Have you done checks of how many, I don't know, birth dates differ and stuff like that? And have you tried to push out your stuff out to the uh, data out there? That is a wonderful suggestion. We have not. Um, right now, we are more focused on just getting the alignments. And I, I, I take your point. It would be helpful to do an assessment of our own to get a sense for how accurate things are. Um, I get a sense that the problem is not that the problem, I think, though, is not so much that there might be some inaccuracies. It's that those, accuracy, those inaccuracies might change day by day. So you know, you might get one thing right, and then another thing might change to something that's not correct. Somebody might do something uh, not entirely ethical to somebody's you know, account for one reason or another. And so those are things that you have to watch out for. Um, so 
I want to go on to a little more detail about some of the benefits that we've that we've we've seen from this linked data work. The first is that it helps us add ontological context, and that's a fancy way of saying that it helps us better understand how our data relates to itself. Uh, so, to give you a specific an example about uh, a, a way GeoNames has helped us uh, address a technical problem that we faced. Uh, we have, as I mentioned earlier, RSS and email services. And they both basically work in the same back end. When, when an article is tagged about being, a new to be, about being a new topic, it's sent out over the feed or gets sent out as, uh, as an email. And one of our feeds that you can sign up for is Italy, the country in which I got a flat tire this morning. Um, and whenever we write a new article about Italy, it gets duly tagged and an email or an RSS feed item goes out and the user is happy. However, it is our longstanding practice to, target, to tag an article at the most specific level possible. So if an article is about Rome, even though Rome is in Italy, uh, it will get tagged as being about Rome and not as being about Italy. So as a consequence, our user won't get the email and they're going to miss, mix out, miss out on some, of the, uh, on some of the data that is relevant to their information need. So through the linked data work, we've been able to through our mapping of geo names, make simple queries like show us all the places we write about that are in Italy, and we can use that information now to augment the quality of these feeds. And this is just a small example of how linked data can help us offer better, more accurate services uh, that are both more comprehensive because it provides us with a context that we didn't previously have. So that's one example of how linked data helps because it can add context. Another example. Uh, that linked data uh, of what linked data can do that's positive for our organization is it helps with automatically aligning data. Uh, we produce a lot of APIs at nytimes.com. We I encourage you to check out uh, our developer pages at developer.nytimes.com if you want to see all of them, and. We have, uh, for example, a Congress API, which lets you retrieve the votes of every member of Congress uh, in the United States for every for every law over the last 30 years. It's a pretty cool database. Uh, we also, of course, have the New York Times archive, which uh, contains everything we've ever written. So the problem is the, New York, uh, the Congressional API has a key uh, called the Congressional BioID. The Library of Congress assigns every legislature in the United States a unique ID. Uh, and it is not the same as the subject headings that we use for our index. So as a consequence, we have two different APIs that we offer that address the same entities by two different names. Here's an example. This is Senator Al Franken, the junior senator from Minnesota. And he is addressed in the New York Times archive with the identifier Franken, Al, P-E-R. However, in the Congress API, he has that, that identifier. So it would be nice if we could provide developers with a mapping between the folks in our archive and the folks you can find out information about in this API. And not only external folks, but internal folks. Uh, we didn't have this information. And to go through the Congress, though not a huge task, it's still kind of a time consuming task to map each and every one of these things by hand. But because uh, we've done this linked data work, it turns out that Freebase has, for a lot of the people that we've aligned, their congressional bio ID. So all we had to do was make a simple query to Freebase's API and database the Creative, Common, the Creative Commons license result. And we have an alignment now between our API, between two of our internal APIs that we didn't actually have to make. Um, it's little efficiencies like this that, uh, that are another reason that we find linked data to be really compelling as a, as, as a knowledge management approach. And the last uh, thing I want to talk about, and probably the coolest, is that linked data lets you do non-traditional aggregations. It lets you slice and dice data in ways that would have been difficult, if not impossible, uh, without the help of linked data. To give you a few examples, uh, we were able, using our GeoNames data, to create a new kind of news map. Now, news maps are not new. They've been around for a while. But Geo GeoNames and linked data lets us, do a, lets us uh, take a new spin on this old idea. So prior to uh, our work in linked data, we couldn't have even done this. We didn't know the latitudes and longitudes of the places we wrote about. So linked data helped us get to this point. And uh, we are able, of course, uh, to show you the articles that correspond to a, uh, a given place. Um, 
And that's cool, and it's helpful to sort of see how the news is oriented geographically. But what's really cool is that with this linked data stuff, not only can we show you the articles about a given place, but we can also show you the people that were born there and articles about them. We can show you the companies that are headquartered there. And we can show you a bunch of different other facets. And that's the kind of pivoting around data that linked data lets you do that we wouldn't have been able to do otherwise. Another um, cool thing that we were able to do with linked data is create new ways of querying the archive that might be personally relevant to people. Uh, it turns out that Freebase, for a lot of different um, individuals that we've aligned, uh, stores where they went to college, uh, where they went to university, where they got their degree. And so using that data, we were able to build a little application that lets you query uh, the New York Times archive uh, for alumni of given schools. So uh, this is an example of the, of the application in action retrieving the alumni that we have written about that we know went to Harvard University. And you can imagine this kind of topical aggregation, this ability to say, I want to see all the articles about folks who went somewhere, or folks in a certain profession, or folks from a given geographic area, could really be helpful in targeting your content into a bunch of different environments. You can imagine, you know, for instance, in a social network scenario, where you have a profile that describes the user's interests, and where they're from, and where they went to school, and all that fun stuff. Being able to use linked data, with linked data, you can probably find articles that are going to be more interesting that, to that person. So that's another way that this linked data stuff uh, lets you do non-traditional aggregations. And uh, the second to last, and perhaps my personal favorite, is an application we built called Standing Tall. It turns out that for about 1,500 people, Freebase uh, lets you know how tall they are. And I thought, well, what the world really needs is an application where you can browse the historical archive of the New York Times based on the height of the people written about. So we built that. Uh, and uh, over here on the left-hand column, you can see uh, the individuals that are in the height range 4'9 to 5'4. It turns out that the shortest person that we have data for is Madeleine Albright, who is 4'9. However, for uh, those of you in the audience that are a fan of New Jersey's, uh, of the MTV show Jersey Shore, we have not added data for Snooki yet, and I understand she is shorter than Madeleine Albright. So this, uh, this, this demo needs to be updated with that latest data. That being said, um, what you're able to do in this, there's a couple of cool things about this. First of all, you can uh, browse the archive by criteria that, nobody's ever, uh, th 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 that nobody would ever invest the effort in to make otherwise, but it's right there because we've already done this mapping. Um, another, uh, another cool thing about this is that we're able to create a reasonable uh, reference experience sort of on the fly just by, just by querying out to other linked data sources. Um, Freebase gives us some nice demographic information right here. Uh, we're able to get uh, some reference material to describe you know, who the person is. We can show you the most recent articles from our archive about them. And we can do other things. We can pull things in like the most recent tweets this person has sent out or uh, the, the books uh, that they've authored and the movies they've been in. All that stuff is available through these linked data sources. Uh, which brings me to the last demo and the newest. In fact, this one uh, has not really seen the light of day outside of the lab yet because it's still very much a work in progress. But it's an attempt to sort of fuse all of the different lessons we've learned about linked data into a single user experience, and it's called conceptual. And basically, what this prototype lets you do is type in any of the concepts uh, that we've mapped so far. And it goes out and does a bunch of different API calls, depending on the type of thing you've asked for. Uh, but just to give you a, a quick taste, I've looked up Brooklyn, New York, which is where I uh, where I currently live. And uh, because of GeoNames, we can show you the map, so we can show you where Brooklyn is. Um, and using another one of our APIs, we can show you uh, which concepts in the New York Times archive most frequently co-occur with Brooklyn. Regrettably, it seems that murders and attempted murders is the number one. Uh, but I assure you, my neighborhood is lovely. Um, and, and so you could all click on those and browse a narrower list of articles that were about both of those topics. Uh, another thing that you can do, uh, building on the work that we've done in linked data, is we have this little widget down here, which shows you people who were born in Brooklyn, New York. And if you click on one of them, it reorients, it reorients the experience uh, it reorients the experience around those individuals. So that is the latest, greatest work. Oh, yeah, and we have some facts that we're pulling uh, about, uh, about Brooklyn as well. Yes? So you just got me to the question that you said 
Brooklyn murders and yes. murders, but it's safe. Maybe it, it's safe now. Yes. So. You know, it would be interesting to see how it varies. So like much. a histogram that, yeah, no, we're actually, we're actually it's doing. It's a time component because you have it. You have archive, right? Yes, and we're actually, we're actually doing a project right now to sort of look into how our metadata evolves over time, um, which, based on your suggestion, I will consider incorporating into this prototype. Um, but this is the sort of stuff you can do with linked data. It basically lowers the, it lowers the cost and the amount of work that it takes for an organization to take an archive of documents and cut it up in new and interesting ways that not only help you find what you're looking for, but as, as was just helpfully illustrated by Dunya, uh, ask interesting and new questions that you, that, that you might not have uh, even thought to, to ask before uh, seeing the data this way. So that is why linked data is cool. Uh, I mentioned what the areas of improvement are, so I'll just say a couple words now about where we want to take this work next. But before I do that, are there any further questions? Yes? Just a technical question out of curiosity. What technologies do you use to handle linked data? So we use almost everything is custom. Um, we, right now, one of the challenges that, uh, that we faced in developing this platform, and this platform is over a few years, is that when we started, um, this work, the only sort of semantic web capable platform for storing this stuff using RDF and retrieving it with Sparkle was the, w w w were a couple of open source projects that while very promising in their direction, were not at that point uh, capable of delivering the performance that we required. Uh, so we decided to store all of our links as relational data in a, in a typical relational database. And the APIs are just PHP on top of that. The applications that I've shown you are HTML, CSS, and JavaScript on top of those PHP APIs. And data.nytimes.com is currently generated by a static Java process that trolls the database and regenerates the pages. So that's how the whole platform is put together. Yes? I have a question. Are there quite some features that you tag uh, in your index? Is that all supervised or manually done? It's all manually done. So no automatics at all? So there is one automated step in the process, but it's a supervised step. So what happens? It's supervised. Yeah. So when an article goes from the newsroom to the website, uh, it's run through a rule-based information extraction uh, system that was provided to us by a company named Teragram, which is now part of SAS Institute. And what Teragram does is it applies this giant dictionary of rules to our news articles and suggests uh, to the producer the tags they might want to associate with the article, but then a human being has to look at that list of tags and choose the ones that are appropriate and add the ones that are missing. So it is, there is a somewhat automated step in the process, but it is a fully supervised automated step. And the New York Times <coughs> Index, the print publication, doesn't do that. They do everything manually. Yes? What happens Right now, we do store some multimedia uh, metadata around multimedia. We store, you know, caption, creator, stuff like that. However, we don't tag our images with the same level of metadata right now. We do some work uh, with our images that relies on the metadata of the articles they're associated with, which is a reasonable first pass. But it would be better if we had more specific metadata. Yes. Um, does it affect your work? Does it affect? back the editors and the writers, do you have an impact on the, let's say, editorial policy of the I, well, I, I will say that this work raises questions of editorial policy, especially around the community curated data. Um, those are discussions that we are currently starting to have because the stuff is becoming more real. Uh, but I can't, I can't point to any one thing and say this work has changed that because this work is just really uh, getting rolled out into production. It's mostly been a research project. And it was only last month that we relaunched the first production version of the APIs. So before I take any more questions, I'm just going to say a couple of things about the, new, the, the direction we're going to continue to take this work. Uh, we felt that after R&D did this study that there was value in linked data for news organizations. So we're continuing uh, this work to map our subject headings to external data sources. Um, and in fact, uh, I don't know if any of you are familiar with this great tool that Google open sourced called uh, uh, Google Refine. 
uh, but it's a nice tool that was released by the Freebase team that makes this kind of mapping exercise even easier. So we'll probably be investigating how to apply that moving forward. Um, we're also in the process of, opera uh, of turning what we built as an experiment in R&D into a real digital infrastructure. The first component of that launched in December with our semantic APIs, and there's still some work to do on that. Uh, and we're also, um, we also, um, well, we launched the APIs, that's what that bullet is. And the other thing that we, we are doing is we're collaborating with other media organizations to uh, look at other problems uh, around linked data, specifically uh, with semantic markup. And I will say a couple of words about that next. Um, and that thing is called R News. But before I do, are there any further questions about the linked data work? Awesome. So now I'm going to change gears 100% and talk about another project that we have in R&D. Uh, but I'm going to speak about this very briefly because I realize that we're, we're, we're getting near the end of the hour. Um, so this project uh, is also related vaguely to semantics. However, it is focused on a different slice of the problem. Um, and that right there, uh, in case you're wondering, is a picture of a gentleman crawling up the uh, outside of the New York Times building. We had two of these gentlemen crawl up the wall in one day. Uh, it was an exciting day. Uh, fortunately, they both got to the top safely. Uh, so the, this R News project is a project that the New York Times has carried out in collaboration with a uh, digital industry standard, uh, uh, sorry, a media industry digital standards body called the International Press Telecommunications Council. And the IPTC is a, uh, about, it, it has been around since 1965. Uh, and it is a place that the media can come to discuss the needs, uh, the sort of technical needs of news organizations. And traditionally, IPTC has focused on creating standards for the digital syndication of news. So the file formats that AP and Reuters and AFP and DPA uh, uh, use to syndicate news across the wire are developed by the International Press Telecommunications Council. And its membership includes uh, sort of a who's who of, news, of major news agencies and photo services and vendors. So the International Press Telecommunications Council was the sort of uh, center for the work that I'm about to describe. And that work is, is to develop a vocabulary uh, and a data model for embedding publishing metadata directly into HTML documents. And the reason that that became an area of focus for the uh, International Press Tele Telecommunications Council is that there is kind of a problem with the way the web works today from the perspective of news publishers. And that is that we as human beings, owing to the four billion years of evolution that we have conveniently positioned between our ears, can look at this article and say, oh, this right there is the story. Uh, that's the photo that goes with the story. That's the, that's the headline associated with that story. However, in the general case, that same problem is not very obvious to a machine. HTML is sort of an undifferentiated mass of markup specifying how a page should look much more than what the page means. Uh, and the reason that we had that disconnect is that most websites today are built using an architecture that looks something like this, where you have a display tier, which is the HTML and JavaScript that gets sent, sent to the user, a data tier, where the, where the actual data that constitutes the site lives, and then this logic tier, which translates user requests into responses that are sent to the display tier. And the majority of publishing organizations on the data tier have their data really well specified. Um, it's usually in some sort of database, like maybe a relational database, where every data asset is divided into columns that have types, that have <coughs> names. Uh, but when they get served over the web, uh, they get served as a large HTML document. And all that beautiful structural metadata that many publishers have invested years in structuring um, is lost to the end user. Now, that wouldn't be so bad, except that the web sees all of our sites through the very dark lens of the HTML that sits on top of them. Another way of saying it is that the HTML that we publish obscures all that nice structure that we've been working on for years and years and years. So we at the IPTC began to ask ourselves the question, well, is there something we can do is there something we can do from a technical standards perspective to help address this problem? And, uh, and it is a problem because with structured data, your result on a search engine might look like that instead of the re result there. And all the studies we've read shows point to uh, prettier results getting more clicks. So 
we started to look uh, in, let's see, the fall of 2010 at the sort of landscape of, of technical standards that were out there that could help us address this problem. And it turns out we were able to identify four of them. Uh, microformats, RDFA, microdata, and uh, JSON. All four of these technologies give you the ability to take a raw HTML document and attach something to it that, that, that starts to specify what the document is actually saying. Do you have a question? OK. Um, and each one of these standards has different pros and cons, and I'd be happy to, I'd be happy to talk at length about what those pros and cons are. But for the, in the interest of brevity, I'm just going to say that in our work, we decided to focus on both RDFA and HTML5 microdata. Those were the two standards we thought uh, were best suited uh, the challenge of, of creating a standard for embedding, embedding publishing specific metadata. However, those standards are just a starting point. They're just tools for doing something, and tools applied without a blueprint uh, you know, don't tend to yield very good results. Uh, put more specifically, the, the, these tools like RDFA and Microdata let you say this part of the page is this thing. However, uh, something even as simple as headline will get multiple names if there's not coordination. You know, for instance, bloggers might call a headline a title. We at the Times would probably call it a headline. Uh, our our, our um, colleagues in Germany would probably call it an Uberschrift. So there needed to be a standardization effort, a blueprint developed for how we would apply these tools so that the industry could really derive the benefit from these, uh, from these approaches. And so we call that blueprint R News. And R News is a data model for embedding publishing. Uh, sorry, embedding machine read readable publishing metadata in web documents and a set of suggested implementations. So to tease that definition apart, R News is a data model. That's the data model. It's a data model that has been engineered specifically for embedding publishing specific metadata into web documents. So it is not meant to be an exhaustive ontology of news. There's a few efforts underway to specify that kind of ontology, and there is great value in doing that. But our news is not trying to be that. Our news is just trying to capture the subset of the data model that's important for this very specific purpose. And lastly, it's a set of suggested implementations. We have documentations on rnews.org uh, that specify all the different ways that you can use, uh, the, the, the two different ways you can implement rnews on your site using either HTML5 microdata or RDFA. Now, uh, the JSON is, is grayed out because there has been some interest in using JSON for this purpose, but not enough to justify creating a third way of implementing rnews just yet. So the IPTC, as I mentioned earlier, has traditionally focused on the syndication uh, piece of the standards puzzle. Uh, the IPTC uh, specifies how articles get syndicated over the wire, and the publishers choose how to store them. And our news uh, adds a new capability to that publishing pipeline by enabling uh, publishers to take the metadata they get here, store here, and project it out to here so that the rest of the web can see the metadata that they've been storing internally. So this is the uh, sort of timeline of the development of our news. And we're really proud at the IPTC at the speed at which this, this project has proceeded. We incorporated it as a formal IPTC project in September of 2010. Um, and over the next year, we're, we're able to get from version 0 0.1 in March to version 1.0 in October. Uh, and we have started to implement our news on, uh, on nytimes.com, and that work is ongoing. And you will hopefully see it in the not-too-distant future when you right-click and view source. So what does our news let you model? Well, basically, it takes uh, the sort of stuff that a news organization publishes and breaks it down into these objects. Uh, everything that we publish is regarded as a news item. And a news item could be associated with an image object, an audio object, and a video object. Uh, a news item could also be, I'm sorry, a, a news item can be one of those things, um, and it could also be an article. And each one of those objects has, have properties specific to those individual media types. Um, and a news item can have one or more comments, and it can be either about or it can mention a concept. Uh, as, uh, if it's about a concept, that's really the core subject matter of the article. If it mentions a concept, it's just something that sort of occurs incidentally in the context of the article. And a concept can either be an abstract concept like terrorism, or it can be a person 
a location or an organization. So you can use RNews to associate articles with this kind of metadata. And all those, those three things, people, loca locations, and organizations, can be associated with the postal address. And lastly, articles can be, uh, uh, can, uh, can be associated with a creator, a contributor, a provider, a copyright holder, an accountable person, and a source organization. And those relationships take advantage of the person and organization classes um, I described just a second ago. So that's what our news, that's how our news models the news. This is the sort of fundamental data model that we, we, we provide publishers to embed publishing specific metadata into their websites. Now I could, uh, I could go on about those individual classes, but if you want to read more about them, uh, I encourage you to go to rnews.org to see this sort of full uh, uh, specification uh, in, its, in, in its full glory. Uh, but if you're a publishing organization, what does it mean to implement the standard on your website? Well, taking this sample article about Libya as, uh, as a starting point, if you pop the hood on that article today, you're going to see a bunch of HTML markup underneath it. In order to implement our news on this, uh, on this article uh, using microdata, what you have to do is go through uh, that HTML and add a new attribute. That attribute is called item prop. And in a meta tag, if you say the item prop is, uh, say, uh, word count, then the value of the meta tag is taken to be the value for that property. So this meta tag says this article has a word count of 879 words. Um, also, you can add item props inside the body to model other things that are associated with the article. And when you're all done with this, you can run it through an HTML5 parser, and we'll get a nice formatted object that contains all the metadata that's in the article in a machine-readable format. Uh, you can also implement it using RDFA, which is similar to HTML5 microdata. Instead of um, item property, we use, uh, sorry, instead of item prop, um, um, RDFA uses property, but it's used in much the same spirit. The difference between RDFA and HTML5 microdata is that RDFA is based on the RDF specification from the World Wide Web Consortium. So when this document is parsed, what you get out is not just sort of a data object, but you get out well format well-formed well, uh, RDF that you can then plug into all the different systems that have been engineered around that standard. So that, those are the, but to, it, it, to, to uh, sum up what I'm saying in this respect, those are the two, that, that's how you implement R news on your site. You basically go into the templates that you use to generate your content and you add a little bit of extra markup and then you've created a site that has machine readable metadata embedded directly into it. So, our news uh, was, as I mentioned, a fairly fast process. And the one thing that we tried to do was uh, to, to include as many different points of view as possible. So we did everything we could to reach out to other organizations. And we talked about it all over the world. We talked about it in London. We talked about it in Berlin. We talked about it in New York. I'm talking about it in Slovenia today. And we are. Oh, and we were we, we tried to get as much feedback as we could from publishers to make sure that the standard was uh, as broadly acceptable as we can make it. And so those are uh, some of the people we talked to, and we incorporated some of the feedback that they gave us. And then last summer, Google announced this effort called Schema.org. Is anybody here familiar with Schema.org? Okay, uh, Schema.org is essentially uh, Google's. Uh, uh, sorry. I shouldn't say Google. Schema.org is a is a is a website that is published by a consortium of search engines that include uh, Google, Microsoft, and Yahoo, and I believe uh, Yandex has also joined the consortium. And what Schema.org uh, does is it publishes a set of vocabularies that you can use to embed uh, metadata about the sort of things that your website contains. This should sound familiar because that's what we sought out to do with our news. And at first when this was announced, we had a moment of, oh, well, I guess we don't need to work on this anymore. And then we realized that this was a really good opportunity for uh, collaboration. So we reached out to the team in charge of schema.org and we worked with them to incorporate the R new standard into the standard published at schema.org now. So, so today, you can implement R news using mar you can implement almost the complete R news data model using the properties and vocabulary specified at schema.org in a way that is sanctioned by both the IPTC and the major search engines, which it turned out to be a major victory for us because before we started working with schema.org, there were certain things that we wanted to have modeled that weren't modeled as clearly as we would have liked that are now part of the standard that all three major English search engines are supporting. So it was, a, I think, a really good thing for the IPTC and a really good thing for this consortium. So that is, um, 
that is our news. And uh, that is the conclusion of my remarks. So thank you so much for having me here. I hope you found this, this work interesting. And I'll be happy to answer any, answer any questions now.